Coming up on today's Wild West, the Miles City Bucking Horse Sale. Come on, Tony. We'll take you behind the shoots of a Wild West weekend in a historic Montana cowboy town. Then we'll ride the California desert with the Corral 14 wagon train. It's like the whole world slows down. Whoa. Today's Wild West, just ahead. The Wild West. It's still out there. And we'll show you how to find it. This is today's Wild West. Buck and Bronx. And Buck and Bulls. Cowboys and cowgirls. It's awesome. <laughs> I'm having so much fun. Welcome to historic Miles City, Montana. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for the world famous Miles City Bucket Horse Sale? Awesome. Rain or shine. Shakes face, center right men. On the third weekend of May, Miles City is the center of the cowboy world. All right, here we go, Dylan Grant, your bull rider. Since 1951, the Buck and Horse Sales provided ranchers with a showcase for their bucking horses and bulls. Get around, pretty nice bull. We'll give 5,000. Auctioned off to rodeo stock contractors. And it all makes for an action-packed weekend for rodeo fans. Back in the day, back in the 20s and 30s, there was tens of thousands of horses in this country, so... Everybody and their dog was raising horses, and pretty quick there was way too many, so they decided they'd gather some up and have a sale. And Rodeo cowboys ride Bronx and bulls competing for cash in one of the season's first big events. Top rider can walk away with $20,000. Fans in the grandstand get an exciting rough stock weekend of bucking Bronx and bulls. And usually a full slate of horse racing as well. But a steady rain on this particular year turned the arena into a sea of mud. It's gonna be western today, huh? Yeah, it'll be good. Forcing the races to be canceled. <laughs> Except for an event known as wild horse racing. <laughs> Teams of riders catch a wild horse that roars out of a chute, somehow strap on a saddle, and get a rider on board, who hopefully can stay on board long enough to ride that horse with just a halter rope, no bridle, all the way around the track. It gets a little crazy and gets a little rough, especially for the cowboys. When I mugged her, she came up and it was my bad. I was looking down at her and she came up and hit me in the nose. So. Despite squished hats and a few bumps and bruises, the horses emerge unscathed, <laughs> and the mud-drenched cowboys have a good laugh. Yeah, it was a hell of a ride. That was fun. For the rodeo cowboys here to compete on Bronx and Bulls, this good time weekend is also serious business on the rodeo circuit, and the gear includes lots of tape. For some guys, things go well. Others, not so much. Didn't go well, that's for sure. He just left really strong and I didn't have my feet set as hard as I should have. And that's it. tough sport. Oh yeah. Keeping it all going are the guys in the arena, led by shoot boss Ty Linger. You need to be kind of the fellow that makes sure that everything's moving forward. And uh, if you have any kind of a wreck, something goes sideways, you need to be able to quickly figure out where you're going next, try to keep the, the show moving, try to keep the horses getting bucked and the guys getting on and uh, the crowd into it a little bit. It gets a little tougher when it's uh, rainy and, and cold like it is today. Drawing a great bull from L4 Livestock on the North Platte, Nebraska, they call the bull Hurricane. Ties the third generation of his family to handle the shoots at the Bucking Horse Sale. My grandpa Sonny's in the PRCA Hall of Fame as well as the National Cowboy Hall of Fame. My dad rode bareback horses at the NFR, was a, a top ten placer. 
There's been a linger running the shoots here for over 50 years now, so it's it's pretty neat to be a part of that tradition and getting to, to know the guys that'll come back and get on year after year. Good people. It's it's fun to be a part of. The rodeo pickup men have the best seat in the house, but their focus is on safety for both the rider and the horse. I'm out there for the horse. Yeah, you want to help the guys, but. I want to get the horse out of the arena as safe as we can. And I sure don't want my horse hurt, and I sure don't want their horse hurt either. 43. And it wouldn't be a rodeo without a rodeo clown. Jason Whistlenut Dent comes up with all kinds of crazy ways to keep the crowd entertained, like playing with bulls on a teeter-totter. <laughs> Whistlenut even has his own bull. Only that he rides in the grand entry carrying the American flag. As long as you're making the people happy that are here, uh, and, and the rodeo's getting along good, and, and you know the, 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 the game is to get people involved and injected and have a good time while they're doing it. Sit down. There's a serious side to the work of a rodeo clown and the bullfighters that join him during the bull riding competition. Their job is to distract the bull after the animal throws the cowboy, and you better be quick. Riding Bronx and bulls is obviously not for the faint of heart. Told them 1600 part. You the saying goes, it's not if you get hurt, but when and how bad. But just like football or any other contact sport, these cowboys do it because they love it. It's a pretty big deal to get to ride here, I'll bet, huh? Just like the rest of them, I guess. The yeah. Pants, that's first thing I They're all good. All right, Tinley, hang in there. Woo! You bet Tinley, now save it. Many a rodeo star gets their start very early in life in the ever popular event known as mutton busting. Riding sheep is a traditional rite of passage out west for kids, and it's always a memorable part of a rodeo. But the local rodeo queen's always quick to provide a little TLC and pose for a picture. Short go around, Connor Bull. Connor Munion, your bull rider. Come on, Connor. The Bronx and Bulls here at the Buck and Horse Sale are born to buck. Animals raised and bred specifically for rodeo. Misty Arneo raises bucking horses at her Montana ranch. It takes a special breed of horse to make them buck. They've got their own bloodlines. We've started registering our horses so we can keep track of their pedigrees on how they're bred. We just do it for a hobby. We enjoy doing it. We don't have that many horses. We just, uh, we're trying to do it for fun and, I don't know, raise some good bucking horses and have a good time doing it. In past years, as many as 600 bucking horses changed hands here. That's down to less than 200 today, but there's still a lot of business done here. Yeah, there's uh, lots of buyers here representing several different rodeo strings, so it's always a it's always a lively market here. However, it's not all business, of course. I love the mud, the drinking, the partying, oh, and, the and there's a reason they call this the Cowboy Mardi Gras. That is great. When you come to the historic cowboy town, you gotta check out the historic cowboy bar, like the Montana bar. Came to Bucking Horse Sale in 79 and fell in love with it. Come to Mile City Bucking Horse City, Sale, it's ever so fun. The Montana bar's on the National Register of Historic Places, but this whole town is historic. Miles City was named after General Nelson Miles, commander of Fort Keogh, built here in 1876, after the Sioux and Cheyenne wiped out General George Custer and much of his 7th Cavalry at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. After the war, many Native Americans posed for Fort Keogh's official photographer, Christian Barthelmus. He liked the Indians. He, he had a special connection with them. Buddy Miller's great-grandfather. He very much appreciated their culture. Many of those photographs are displayed at the Range Riders Museum, where Bunny is the curator. His father put him on a ship from Germany and sent him over to the United States when he was 12 years of age to keep him out of the Prussian Wars. You can read all about the adventurous life of Barthelmus in the book, Photographer on an Army Mule, which also includes many more of his frontier photographs.
Built on the original site of the fort, the Range Riders Museum is a vast collection of the artifacts of the cowboys and Indians who once lived here, plus some dinosaur bones from the area's even more ancient history. You can see the uniform General Miles wore, a rifle picked up off the Custer battlefield, and a diorama of the old fort, once home to 1,600 people. While the fort's gone, an officer's home has been preserved, where you can step back into a bygone era. There's probably been more interesting historical things happen in this area than anywhere else in the West. Founded in the 1930s by local volunteers, the museum's something like the Miles City Family Scrapbook. The exhibits include a miniature version of Old Main Street. I always get a kick out of Mr. Krause's. He's a gun maker and he's also a fiddle maker. But the side saddle of Wally Badgett's grandmother is displayed. I'm glad that the museum has it to preserve it because I can come touch it and kind of feel like I knew her even though I never met her. Wally's family came here in the 1880s. And while the museum artifacts are cool to see, it's the personal connections you discover here that are especially interesting. Like this room filled with portraits of the old time cowboys who once rode the range. These are the cowboys that Hollywood has always tried to emulate and has never been able to do it. And there's a whole room of them there. And I can look at those guys and think, boy, the stories that they could tell. And for more than a century, cowboys have been buying their gear at Miles City Saddlery, a piece of living history that's been in business on Main Street since 1909. But it wouldn't be here without Mary Lou Dibel and her late husband, Jack. We've lived in the area all of our life, and, and the Miles City Saddlery is just a, an important part of history. Area ranchers who rode to the rescue of the saddlery in the late 1980s after a destructive fire threatened to close the store for good. When it burned, uh, and the water damage came over into the store, why Tat shut it down and he wasn't going to open it up again. So we bought it and opened it up and actually ran the store from the ranch, driving back and forth about 55 miles for many years. For the work of art that this is, I said, they're probably underpriced. This Western store once manufactured thousands of its famous cog shell saddles, still a prestigious brand more than 100 years later. The saddlery is busy as Christmas during the buck and horse sale. And we do special orders for people. Where shoppers can take a free tour of the store's second floor museum, where more than 100 historic saddles are displayed, most with that cogshell brand stamped into the leather. Look at this. Look at that. <laughs> That's something with the, the swells here. And the... They keep you on a buck and horse. You know, a lot of people that like to come up and look, and they're amazed at all the saddles. The Olsen brothers. You'll also see photographs of the cowboys who rode them. One of them is maybe sitting on this saddle? Yes. One of whom rode this premium saddle number one. Just the style, just what they liked. There were many, many saddleries, but of course the Miles City saddlery was the, one of the best. Back downstairs, the store's resident historian Lori Simpson shows us a fascinating book of historic customer orders from 1922, when prices were a bit lower. The average round for a saddle was $83. The old saddles were quite a bit smaller than the ones they make today. The men weren't very big back then, and the saddles weren't very big, or horses, and the Mile City Saddlery could make a saddle within a week. You can still buy custom-made leather goods here, like a whiskey flask, spur straps, and new saddles that can be true works of art. Miniature replica. Like this one, created by the late Dick Swanson, featuring leather carvings of wildlife cowboys and Indians. I like this one. And the saddlery remains a one-stop shop for anything a cowboy or a cowgirl might need. I always like to come here. This is one of the few places that you can buy silk scarves, you know, and I, I love these scarves. What do you think? I like it. Oh, I like that. Meantime, Susan's found the perfect hat. There you go. It doesn't take long. Once I find something I like. Hats and saddles, boots and jeans, even buck and horse bling. There's all kinds of cool things to discover in this classic Western store. So how do you paint with the crowbar? I mean, Including artist Bob Watts, who paints custom pictures. Put in some pine trees. With a crowbar. We'd had a financial setback at home and three little kids at home, Christmas coming. Bob's story begins during a desperate Christmas season years ago. He'd set up his easel at a new mall in Bismarck, North Dakota, but no one was buying. That night, my headlights hit the inside of the garage wall, and here hung this crowbar up there. Next day, he dipped that crowbar in paint for the very first time. 
I went to the mall, got on the stage, and I'm up there trying out this crowbar every which way, and I was concentrating so hard, and 30 to 40 people were standing there that I hadn't realized. They lined up to order paintings done with the crowbar. It was fantastic, and we had a good Christmas. Bob has since sold thousands of crowbar paintings. But you've got the tip of it so that you can slide the, slide the bar along on a picture and create your line for branches, for example. And you've got the edge of the bar, so you can go along there and put in some pine trees and the flat of the bar to texture it. And you can slide it a little bit. Look at the trees pop in there. But he does use a brush as well at times, like for this painting of a moo hopper. Wyoming's got its jackalope. Now we've got our moo hopper. And more serious commission work, like this beautiful mural on a Mile City building. More of his murals are on display in nearby Forsyth, Montana. It's never been boring, and I never paint the same thing twice. So it's been quite a career. I always say when I wear this out, I get to retire. Just across the street from the saddlery, we meet another unusual entrepreneur. Yeah, I'm pretty old school. Creating cowboy leather goods on a foot-powered sewing machine that dates back to 1910. I like stuff that never wears out or breaks down. Steve Moran cowboyed all over the West for 45 years, building leather gear in his spare time. Today, he's full-time and can fix your boots, build a saddle, and make just about anything out of leather. Here lately, there's been gun belts. Everybody's been wanting a gun belt here lately. Much of his work features his ornate carving. I don't consider myself a craftsman. I just do it because I like to do it. I like everything about it. I really do. Do I still wear those? Occasionally. It is fun to watch him work, making bridles, chaps, cowboy cuffs, and other cool Western stuff. I stay incredibly busy. But be patient if you place an order. I start to work here at 6 o'clock in the morning just so I can get something done. This very busy leather artist is usually two months behind. Steve's shop is just inside a window that looks out on a main street that celebrates this town's western heritage. The tree planters are decorated with cattle brands, and the bike racks look like a bridle and reins. And the Buck and Horse Sale Parade features the 7th Cavalry Drum and Bugle Corps from Sheridan, Wyoming. Whistlenut and his bull Oli were there too. <laughs> giving a ride to a rodeo queen. queen. There were snowflakes falling here in mid-May, where it rained for much of the weekend as well. But you can't control the weather. People here just take it in stride. You got it. Let you know you're in Montana. When I came to the Buck and Horse Sale five years earlier, the Mile City weather was like the 4th of July. Hot, sunny, dry, absolutely perfect, with lots of horse racing. But whatever the weather, if you're looking for a true taste of today's Wild West in a cowboy town rich in history, on the third weekend of May, the Mile City Buck and Horse Sale is the place to be. Up next, love and life at four miles an hour, riding the California desert on a wagon train. Once upon a time, not all that long ago, the whole world moved to just four miles an hour. And on a springtime Saturday in California's Mojave Desert, it still does. Life is too short to race through it. Sue Martzoff is the wagon master of the Corral 14 Wagon Drive and Trail Ride, whose members come together several times a year for weekend wagon trains, plus week-long treks that can cover 100 miles or more. Life at four miles an hour is really incredible. You see so much more, life slows down, to where you can see a wildflower that you would have never noticed in a car. Corral 14 is a horse-drawn wagon chapter of Equestrian Trails Incorporated, better known as ETI. Easy, easy. A nonprofit group founded in the 1940s to promote equine legislation, good horsemanship, and the preservation of riding trails throughout California. But for members of Corral 14, this is what it's all about. Spending a day on the trail in beautiful country with good friends, beloved animals, and enjoying the ride. Just takes you back a century where 
people actually have conversations and talk to one another. It's just a harmonious experience. It's an eclectic group of both wagons. It's an implement cart. Implement cart. Yeah, you hook the plow and stuff on behind it. Oh. You don't have to walk. Oh, okay. So. And the animals that pull them, which include mules, mustangs, and minis. Miniature horses. Yep, they're under 38 inches at the withers. After a lifetime of horseback riding, Jeanette Hayhurst made the change from the saddle to the wagon. I rode saddle horses since I was in my teens. Now I'm in my 60s. And my hips started going, they didn't really like the long trail rides anymore. And so I thought, well, driving will be fun. Jeanette's minis were originally intended as a temporary transition, an easy way to learn how to drive a team. I thought I would want to graduate to the bigger teams, but like I said, nope, these guys are fun. And while they're not much bigger than some dogs, Harley and Danny are all horse. I thought maybe they were dogs in disguise. No, they really are horses. They act like horses, they think like horses, they train like horses. They're just a lot less expensive. Clifford Meredith drives a team of Mustangs. Well, I was looking for a horse and I was looking everywhere for a horse that I liked. I couldn't find one. So uh, one day I just drove out to BLM just for something to do. And they have thousands of horses to pick from. He's been driving wagons for more than 20 years. It's just nice to get out and be with people with the same interest and just get out in nature. And you take, you know, take care of your horses. You're a little bit self-sufficient for a week. It's kind of a nice feeling. Somebody invited us to come on the trip and we had never been to Death Valley before. And so once that we went on one trip, we were hooked. Death Valley is the most amazing place to see going four miles an hour. That was more than 30 years ago. Sue's been driving wagons ever since. So for 30 years, we've done the same vacation every year in November and travel 100 miles by covered wagon with our kids. I started going when I was, I believe, seven uh, doing this. And yeah, we've done, done it ever since. Son Wes is carrying on the family tradition with his own family. Well, he must have liked it. Oh, yes, very much so. Uh, you know, the time together uh, with, the, with the horses, with the family, it was a good getaway. Uh, get away from all the stress of the city and everything else and just being out in nature. 13-year-old daughter Macy is growing up riding wagons just like her dad did. I, I like having the time with my family where we're not on our phones and stuff because um, a lot of times we don't have cell service and things. So it's just it's good family time and I bring out a guitar and I sing at the campfire most cool. days. So. All this fun takes an awful lot of work. Here, pull your way and I'll put it in. Watching the teams get hooked up in the morning gives you a sense of what it takes to do this. It's a lot of work. This is not for the faint of heart. Wagon training requires trucks and trailers to haul wagons, gear, and horses. It's labor intensive and does cost a few bucks. If you get out of it for $10,000, you're lucky. But for Norm Nofsier, it's a great investment. He's been wagon training for more than 20 years. Mostly the people. They're great. It's like a family. Everybody, we all get along good and have, have the good interest together. And watching young ones come into it and get started again, and it's fun. Norm, something of a wagon train guru in this crowd, happy to loan his help and expertise to people like Wendy Bailey. Norm Noster kind of took me under his wing, mentored me, taught me a lot. Harnessing, how to drive the mules, how to hook them up to the wagon safely. There's lots of moving parts on a wagon, and big powerful horses and mules can be hazardous if you're not careful. If you were to look at the tongue and the yoke and the single trees, you see a lot of moving parts where you can get your hands, especially when you have animals moving around. But this is a group that has each other's back, always ready to lend a hand. Because if somebody's wagon breaks down, everybody pitches in to fix whatever's wrong with it. All of these friends would do anything for you, give you the shirt off their back to make sure that you could go and come along and be a part of everything. That said, there's no freeloaders here, and Sue believes wagon training is also a great way to raise kids. It teaches them a lot of responsibility, and they're responsible for their own horse to make sure they're fed, they're watered, and in the morning they put everything back together and get on the road by 9 o'clock in the morning, and ev everything is packed in a wagon. So it, it teaches them time management to get all this stuff has to be done by 9 o'clock because everybody's leaving. And if you're not ready and your bed's not made, you 
<laughs> you're out of luck. <laughs> but once you're on the trail, it's all worth it. There's a lot of work that goes into it, and then when you finally get up in the seat they called the box, it's like the whole world slows down to the turn of the wagon wheels. Yeah, it's a lot of work to have fun. That's kind of our motto, but uh, well worth it. The horses work as hard as the humans, and they get a break every hour for some water and a breather. They take very good care of their animals. It's been a long time since we've asked somebody to leave the wagon train because their animals weren't in shape. You Jesus. gotta be in shape. They have to be athletes. And when we have to, you have to consider these animals athletes because they do, they do work. And if you look at the animals as you're going down, this is a great day to drive because the animals have a breeze on them. They're keeping their coats cool. Just like the old days, outriders are always part of a wagon train. Beth Brockman's an endurance rider. Here with boyfriend Otis, who's driving a racing car. It's called a marathon car. It's for, uh, it's for racing, actually. Oh, really? Beth just finished a 50-mile endurance race on her mule, Pretty Boy Floyd. Just to get on the horse um, before dawn and, and finish a ride at dusk um, and uh, following a trail and, and uh, just being on the back of the horse and seeing um, what the horse can give you or mule. <laughs> And they really like to go, so it's fun for them too. Amy Nelson's riding her paint horse Sundance, who's seeing wagons for the very first time. He rode up next to that one and he looked at the wheels and he's like, what is that? Few of us know much about covered wagons. In this hurry up age, we're not too familiar with life at four miles an hour. But if you want to find out what you've been missing, the wagon train of Corral 14 will be happy to help. The fact that we take old historic roads and be out on trails that very few people ride on uh, just brings you back to when the pioneers were coming across the United States and it brings back the spirit of America. That's it for now. We're back next time with more cool stuff from today's Wild West. I'm Mark Bedore. We'll see you down the trail. For more information on the people and places featured in today's Wild West, or to order show DVDs and books, visit todayswildwest.com. Funding for Today's Wild West provided by the Leggett Foundation and the Chuck Wagon Trail Riders Foundation.